Welcome to It's a Grand Life. Did you know that in the United States alone, 2.4 million kids are being raised by their grandparents or other family members other than mom or dad? 2.4 million. It's a Grand Life is a podcast for those grandparents and kinship caregivers who are committed to making a difference for those kids. Grand families are in every neighborhood, every city, tribe, and territory nationwide. If this is you or someone you love, this podcast is for you. Our goal is to offer hope and resources to help you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us wherever you get your audio podcasts and leave a review. Every new subscriber and review helps us reach others that need assistance. Welcome to another episode of It's a Grand Life. Hello, my name is Craig Nash. We'd like to welcome you to another It's a Grand Life. Happy New Year to all of you out there. It's 2024. It's hard to believe that we're in the new year already. And uh, today we're going to the wonderful state of North Dakota. And you know, the the one thing about the the grand family situation and the kinship caregiver uh, situation across this country is that it literally is across the country. There are hundreds of thousands of families that are affected by uh, raising their grandchildren or their uh, their relatives. And we're going to chat with Chris Magstad today from North Dakota, and she's going to tell us what life is like in snowy North Dakota. Chris, welcome to It's a Grand Life. And do you have any snow in North Dakota today? Actually, Craig, we have so little, the ground just has barely any. So it's pretty nice right now. It's, it's a, maybe a little cloudy, but uh, no snow on the ground. Cause I, I, you folks are known for getting quite a bit of snow, aren't you? We are, last year we had an awful lot. And this year we're just getting mild temperatures, barely any snow. Uh, wait till January. It'll change. Exactly right. We, we know it the same in Michigan. We'll we'll pay the piper. We just don't know when. But Yep. Yep. So Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became, you and your husband Kevin became a grand family. Okay. Um, Kevin and I actually have three grandchildren. One lives with our daughter, um, and that's her daughter. And then we have two that are 11 and 12 right now. And those are the two that we've adopted. They were our son's children. Our son, there was a, an unplanned pregnancy in college, <clears throat> which I don't think is, is, not, is very uncommon, you know, these days. Right. But anyway, so... They hadn't known each other very long and they still got married. It was kind of like, you know, after my being adopted, I'm, I'm a little bit, I have a different opinion. I thought maybe they should, they should spend some time together before they got married. But their, her dad said, nope, they're getting married, kind of a shotgun, you know, wedding kind right. of thing. And they did, they got married. Their marriage lasted two years. Okay. There were a lot of drugs and alcohol involved. Marijuana was a big part of it. Cigarette smoking, um, neglect of the children, lots of different examples there. And so when they decided to split up, our son called and said that they were going to separate. And I took the call and I'm, I'm a little bit protective and I'd had the children so much in their, their young lives mm -hmm. that I said, you bring the kids with you. Do, do not leave them there, you bring the kids home. And so he did, he packed up the kids, brought them home. Oh, Craig, they looked so disheveled. They were, they they really needed, you know, first thing was a bath and new clothes. And, and so anyway, that's how they came to us. And our son had absolutely every intention of being a dad. And he told us that. He said, I wanna move out with the kids, I wanna raise them. And we thought, well, that's great. That's great. We really commend you for it. And when they went to court, he he got full custody of the children. Wow. So yeah, yeah, that it was. It made life a lot easier. But he figured out, just like she had, that you know, the early 20s are times where kids are are kids, not kids, but um they're actually starting to they're they're with their friends, they're at the river, they're partying a bit, you know, they're right. having a good time. And, he realized he was missing out on that. So it, it didn't take long and he was out doing the party scene with his friends, mm -hmm. which meant that he wasn't taking care of the kids. And I think it was too easy for him with mom here. Right. You know, mom would give him a bath, mom would feed him, mom would put him to bed. And so <clears throat> I, I didn't make him be a, a dad either, which was probably not good on my part. And so 
pretty soon he he um, moved out and the kids stayed here. It was a bit difficult because we didn't have we didn't have anything to be able to register them from for school or to right. take them to the doctor. But we ended up going for guardianship, which was not not easy at all. We had to get an attorney. We had some issues with the court system. And finally, we and we had a lot of issues with the birth mother and her family. You know, everyone has an opinion. They right. didn't think it was right that we were going to be guardians. It gave us too much power. Um, there was a lot of conflict there. So we finally got guardianship and we were able to do all of those things. You know, some of the things w that we, we made sure and part of our role was to make sure that they saw their parents. So we did we did parental visits and those went okay, but they weren't really great, especially with their biological mother. Um, our son was here fairly often, but didn't really pay a lot of attention to the kids. So um, when we got guardianship, we made sure the parents got had visitation rights, but we also made sure that the grandparents were in their life. Right. And we didn't have to do that. You know, the guardianship does not include the grandparents, right. but we would take them halfway and let them visit with their grandparents and even gave them a few holidays. But the conflict continued. So the journey, Craig, was really, really very difficult. You know, the mom was very, very controversial. She was very, very short with her words. She was very, she just was not, she was not easy to deal with. Um, and her parents as well, you know, they, they really made it difficult. And, and here you and your husband have, uh, have brought the kids in. You've just provide a very stable environment for them, taken all of the stress off of the parents. And, and so allow them to, to live out their twenties uh, as normal, if you will, uh, uh, millennials or whatever uh, group they're in. And yep. yet you had this uh, heartburn from the mom and the, her parents and, and you mm -hmm. didn't have to uh, include the grandparents and, and no. but you wanted to do what was best for the kids. And and you thought that was including the whole family in, in a, a normal uh, uh, structured visitation sequence. But, uh, um, but sometimes that uh, bites your back, doesn't it? And it does. Uh, and uh, it, your best intentions and uh, we're absolutely trying to do the best for our, our grandkids and, and sometimes it doesn't work out. So are they still visiting the grandparents and the birth mom or, or it's, it's um, the birth mom, the birth mom actually moved in the middle of, of the night to Arizona without saying goodbye to the kids, not seeing them anything. And it's been about five or six years now since she's seen them. Um, she, yeah, she thought that we should tell the kids that she moved instead of her, but, but we made her do it. And then um, the grandparents moved to Oklahoma from Baker, Montana. And so they're a longer ways away. And when they want to see them, we've told them they need to come here because we're not going to send the kids across state lines. We're not going to put them alone on a, a flight. Um, it's just and we're not going to drive down there. Right. So we kind of put that on them. Well, they, it was their choice to move. Right. So it's uh, right. obviously uh, um, so. So, but you, you're you're still leaving the door open for them to visit their grandchildren, and it's it's just really on them to to kind of connect the dots there. Have they have they been to North Dakota to visit the kids since they moved? No, no, no. Okay. That, uh, no. Um, that's very very uh, very interesting. But the main thing I know with with our granddaughter, the main thing for us was how can we get this child stable as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. How can we get them connected at school? How can we set up play days and all those things that are so important in these early years? And I imagine your grandkids now are are just like any other kids. They've got friends. They've got play days. They you, you take them where whatever's going on in the in the community, and uh, they've got their own life now, right? They do. And you know that was really difficult because. When Caden and Michaela came to our house, uh, my daughter mentioned early intervention and I had never heard of that before. And so we decided that we'd have them come in and test the kids. And Caden, who was two, was actually a year behind. Okay. So he had the skills and the levels of a one-year-old. One year so we ended up having 
physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, and then a, a preschool that was really designed for kids that are behind. We have a wonderful psychiatrist. We just found the right people and we were very blessed to find them. And he is now um, very intellectual. He is, he's 12 years old. He's in seventh grade. He's doing ninth and 10th grade math. Um, he's now found his voice. He's in a Central Dakota children's choir. He's... Oh. Just absolutely, but he's very black and white and very concrete. Now our daughter, Michaela, she is 11 and she's just extremely creative. So they've, they've really come a long way and they are, you're right. They're just normal kids. And the adoption made that even more secure for them. I think we all felt more secure. We all, we all just beamed that day of adoption. So well, yeah, what, we, you and I have talked about that off the air, but I think share that with our listeners. That's just a beautiful story of how you created this memo family memorial the day that everything was finalized. What was that like for you and the kids? Oh, Craig, it was magical. Absolutely magical. We, um, we had all kinds of things planned. You know, Michaela had a, a manicure and her hair done and, and um, we had gifts for them throughout the day that we gave them. And we had, they got flowers and oh, Michaela, wow. she would put, she had a wrist massage and she held it up all the time, all day long. She was holding it up every picture. And then um, we, we knew a judge that had been, had, was a friend of ours, very soft-spoken, very, he's just a wonderful man. And so I called him one day and I asked if he would be the judge for our adoption. And he said, absolutely. You just tell them to put it on my calendar. And I told the attorney, you know, you just can call and put it on Greg's <laughs> calendar. And she's like, Chris, you can't pick your judge. And I'm like, oh yeah, we can. <laughs> and then they told us that it would be by Zoom and I said, no, no, it has to be in the courtroom. They need to pound the gavel. They need to do, you know, they That's need to nice. do all of those fun things. And he agreed to that. So we were the first the first um, adoption in the courthouse in, in 2022 because they hadn't had it since 2020. So that was really special. And we, um, you know, we had, they had, um, they had t-shirts that said out of my way it's adoption day and oh, they had oh. these great plaques that my friend had made that talked about their adoption that hang in their rooms now and took of course a lot of pictures and then we um we went out to dinner with the the ceremony itself was just great the the funniest thing was that because of caden's age the judge had to ask him if this is what he wanted okay and so you know, he said, okay. And then Michaela, she was like, well, what about me? Because <laughs> she wasn't quite old enough. So they both got to answer. They they kind of let her do that as well. So that was pretty exciting. And then we um, went out to dinner at the Olive Garden and had everything, including dessert. It was absolutely great. So the kids beamed. They just, I can't tell you about the look on their face. I took a picture of them in the back seat of the car on the way. I just couldn't get over it. it. It was just, and I think we probably did too, but it, they they finally felt secure and they knew no one could come and get them. They, they just, they were so happy. They were just so happy. And then this year, we celebrated a year. Every month on the 10th, we gave them a little present for the first year. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, they loved it. It wasn't necessarily much, but it was it was something. And then when it was a year, I grew up on an airport with my dad as a fixed space operator. And he sold Cessna airplanes and we flew all the time. And so I scheduled with a friend of mine at the Bismarck Airport for them to go up in a plane on their one year anniversary. They didn't know it was a surprise. And it was, <laughs> I'm never going to top that. But it, they got both got to fly. They got log books. They got pins that are wings. Oh, man. It was it, the red carpets and it was great. Uh, so as we're talking, and that just sounds just so fantastic. They will have a memory of that and, and, and getting a gift every month. That's just, you've made it so special. But for the folks that are listening, you know, our, our listeners all over the country, and they're they're listening to the challenges you had getting to the, the adoption day. And, but you would tell them, and it can be a hassle, but it's so worth it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it can be difficult. And it was, you know, it was nine years before we adopted them. Right. And the reason we didn't pursue it was because we knew we'd have all kinds of conflict. So we we waited and, and waited and <clears throat> thought there would be a good time. And actually, it was kind of a miracle. Um, their mom called and she said, Chris, will you adopt the children? I, I was a little stunned and I said, absolutely, we would we would love to. And she said, and will you will you waive my twenty thousand dollars in child support arrears? And it was, yep, absolutely never been about the money for us. Right. And Cause she was ready, they were ready to arrest her and put her in jail. So wow. um, yeah. So she was and she wanted her driver's license back. That which was pretty darn important, you know. Yeah. So yeah. So we did, she had, she signed termination of rights and then our son did as well. And that's when we went to court, but no, it's not easy. It's not an easy journey, especially if you've got, you know, all these people pulling at you and, and you're trying to do the right thing. So it, it was a challenge. It was a journey. But there was a, a, a lot of divine intervention involved. I mean, having the mom call and ask you to adopt, you yep. never, ever predicted that. You never oh, no. saw never saw that coming. No, ever. no. And, uh, uh, what a, what a, uh, what, now, so that call comes in. Are, are you like falling out of your chair when you, when you hear that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Kevin was sitting by me and I'm sure you saw my jaw drop because <laughs> I, I was so surprised. I was so surprised and so was he and um i don't think her parents were okay with it and i think they struggle with it to this day because we refer to them as our son and daughter right. and they call us they call us mom and dad and so um that's really hard for them and um, but the kids they want a mom <clears throat> they want a mom and dad they do and they they want they want to be just like their peers right yeah they, um and uh and you you guys have done that and just and and, and you've you've had um it hasn't been an easy journey but boy has it been worth it and and uh and and chris how would you say that uh changed uh your marriage and uh you know your plans for the future when you uh, adopted your grants and, and life is great for them but there has been some adjustment uh with you and kevin right absolutely Absolutely. You know, we were we were empty nesters um, before this happened. And of course, now we're full nest, but <clears throat> it's it's changed us a lot. It's changed Kevin's retirement age to 70 um, when we had financially planned for 65. And it's expensive. What is it? 16 to 20 thousand dollars a year to raise a child. Right. And so we. Um, Kevin and I have coffee every morning, an hour before the kids ever have to get up so that we can talk. We call it our executive meeting because we have family meetings on Sunday nights. And so it, it challenged our quiet time, our conversation time. It, you know, one of the, one of two of the hardest things, one was that we were really conflicted because you've got your son on one hand who's struggling with addiction not in a good place in his life and you're grieving that and then you've got the two children on the other hand that you want to give a a happy healthy um life so you you have to you have to find that in between and i think you don't get to be grandparents which is really hard because you i mean i think in the beginning we didn't discipline them or anything because we wanted to be grandparents and now that's that's really changed um socially that that has that has been a difficult thing because all of our friends they don't have children right. they're right. traveling and they're doing i mean they're doing all kinds of things that that we couldn't do right. and right. it's just we kind of have lost a lot of friends and not that's not to say anything bad about them it's just to say that our lives are different and everyone will say what a wonderful thing you're doing what a blessing and sometimes it's like don't say that <laughs> Don't say that because you know it hasn't it hasn't been easy and um, there have been there yeah there have been a lot of struggles. I think the stress and the tension between the families really affected our health, and I just think that we weren't um, we weren't ourselves. We tried to hide it from the kids, but it was really really tough. It's absolutely so tough, and and we've tried to to keep the door open for uh, um, 
uh, Grace's dad, so he can be involved as, as often as he wants. He he uh, doesn't is not that involved. He, he sees her a couple times a year. It's getting a little better, and her um, and the other grandparents have been great. They see our uh, uh, granddaughter twice a month, and that gives us a little bit of a break. And mm -hmm. they really want to stay in her life, which I think is great. Now, are they 100% like us? Do they do the same thing we would do? No, we're different folks, but it, it all works out. And and uh, Grace has this whole other family and that that's good, but that can be the tension you're describing is real world. And that, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that is uh, not the exception. That's probably more the rule than anything else mm -hmm. I would imagine. Yeah. And, um, uh, but uh, but you guys have, have adjusted and now you have this stable home environment. You've got family celebrations. You've got, they're calling you mom and dad. It's, uh, it's, it's the greatest, greatest um, situation going for what you're, what you're dealing with. So um, you decided to go the adoption route. You didn't do the foster care route, right? So we didn't. And why was we that? Didn't. We, we didn't use the system at all. We didn't go through child protective services. We didn't go through the foster system. Um, we should have probably turned them in for neglect. They still, kids would have still come to us, but it might have been a little easier. I, um, <clears throat> the one of the reasons that we didn't go through foster care, and foster care provides a lot of benefits, a lot of benefits. So a lot of grandparents do it. You know, they get a stipend, they get insurance, they get all of the extra benefits, um, and like SNAP and that kind of thing. We we only use the Medicaid because healthcare is so expensive. And so the one main reason we did not go into foster care is because the kids become wards of the state. And we were not comfortable with that because then they made all the decisions for the kids. And what, what would happen if they decided that we weren't, we weren't the optimal place for the children and we weren't gonna take that risk. And so we, um, we did it all privately and you know craig i think that the majority of grandparents do it private privately because it's family you know you, you don't think about the system when you're thinking about family and so we are we'll lose medicaid um and you know if, if you if you adopt out of the foster system you still get a stipend you still get all of those benefits in north dakota you get free college you know we won't we won't get any of that now we're working on that, but and that's, yeah. that's a serious consideration for for everybody. You know, free college is not cheap. No, but the whole idea that you're going to have the regular visits from the child protective folks at the house and other things, that's something that you really have to evaluate. And um, you do, um, and that so you you made a maybe a financially worse decision, but a peace of mind decision for you and your husband to to really keep some uh, some peace in the house and. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you you are above and beyond raising your grandkids. You are also an advocate for uh, grand families and kinship caregivers all over North Dakota. And and we're going to talk about that in our in our next next week's show. And I'm, I'm really anxious to hear about that. But um, uh, because uh, it's more than just the challenges you've had raising these wonderful kids. It's boy, how can I make a difference for others in the state of North Dakota? But so what, what has been your favorite part? of raising a grand family? <laughs> That's not hard to answer. <clears throat> it's it's the love that you get from the kids. It's the warm snuggles. It's the, you know, laying down with them in bed at night and hearing about their day. And actually, you know, their activities are fun. I thought, oh, great. We're going to be driving to this and driving to that. And, and, you know, the pride that we feel when we see them, when we saw Caden up singing in his first concert for the the um, Central Dakota Children's Choir, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of him. You know, he sings in the house all the time and Michaela's always making us some kind of surprise. And that is just, there's nothing like it. I mean, it, the smiles on their faces, the being able to be there for, for them when they have hard times. You know, I was adopted as well by my grandparents and so being able to talk to them about that and and make it a special thing instead of a kind of a deep dark secret for the family has been really rewarding for me to change that. Well, you have absolutely changed their whole trajectory in life and it's just such a great story 
And that's why you are so passionate in helping others as well. So uh, Chris Magstad, thank you so much for being our guest here on It's a Grand Life. You and your husband, Kevin, are living the grand life. You are loving those kids and making their path straight. And it's we just commend you for it. And uh, you're part of the, uh, uh, what, 2.4 million kids that are in this program nationwide. And and uh, we're looking forward to chatting with you next time to hear about your advocacy role. And so thanks so much for being our guest here on It's a Grand Life. Well, thank you, Craig. I've really enjoyed it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for joining us today for It's a Grand Life. It's a Grand Life provides vital content, regulatory updates, and subject matter experts that are committed to supporting the 2.4 million kids and their caregivers from every neighborhood, every city, every tribe and territory nationwide. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. Every new subscriber and review helps us reach others that need assistance. As caregivers, we are united in purpose. We are driven by hope while providing strength for today and hope for tomorrow. We are truly making a difference in while living the grand life. If you have a suggestion for a future episode, please reach out to us. But we'll see you next time for another It's a Grand Life. Thank you for joining us.